Hi, I'm Jenny Rosenkrantz with the University of Maryland Extension, and I've, it's the beautiful month of May. I love May. All the flowers that were blooming in terms of bulbs are still blooming some of the times, and, and a lot of the herbaceous perennials are coming up. A lot of the trees are absolutely gorgeous. We're gonna be covering something called Baywise, the Baywise, Maryland Baywise Yardstick. And the reason why we're gonna do that is because most of Maryland residents have their water go either to the Chesapeake Bay or the coastal bays. So here on the lower shore, we are definitely into the coastal bays as well as the Chesapeake Bay. And we wanna be very careful about not adding to pollution to the bays. So I'm gonna go walking through step-by-step step with the Maryland Baywise Yardstick to see what individual homeowners can do to protect the base. So join me for Delmarva Gardens, coming here right next on Pack 14. Okay, so the first item on the yardstick is controlling stormwater, and that makes sense. Uh, not everybody has gutters on their houses, but everybody who has a house has a roof. A roof is not something that's going to let water leak into your house, so it's impervious. And all the water from rain comes off of the roofs, in our case, a roof and also a porch. And it comes out, because we do have gutters, in a couple of different places. So right here we have a gutter, and the water from here collects off of the actual roof of the house and the porch. So it's got double the amount of water in that sense. So that means that there's a lot of water coming out of here, which means that that water can actually carry a lot of things out if I do it improperly. So the first thing that we did was put a splash block and that basically is an impervious um, cement structure that takes the water and prevents it from digging holes in the soil and just uh, going right out into the driveway. Instead, what we could do is take this corrugated pipe and attach it to the downspout so that it would be fine. And then the water could go ahead and be directed not toward the house, but away from the house. So you just have to go ahead and, and work with it, uh, get the kinks out, and pull it together. But that will go ahead and move the water away from the house, but also it will allow the water to infiltrate into the gardens. So if you have plants around here that need to be watered on occasionally and you don't have an irrigation system, then that would be the perfect location for this. Now actually I do have some plants here. I have columbine. They like moist afternoon shade. Well, every time it rains, this whole area gets a little bit of moisture every time it rains. Isn't that cool? So I can go ahead and check that off as one inch on my action plan. Okay, let's go take a look and see what we can do in the shade of trees. You know, anytime you have trees, the trees are shading the lawn, so you don't really have a good lawn. And lawns are very important about holding the soils and preventing um, a lot of uh, things just sort of flowing off into waterways and that sort of thing. So instead, when you have trees, if you can go ahead and have like a bed that encompasses a bunch of different trees and you put mulch down, and more important, add some ground covers. So we have a lot of different types of ground covers. I have some, uh, some native ground covers, uh, like this is a beautiful native coral bells. Uh, but we have a lot of other non-natives. So it doesn't matter what you're planting as long as you've got beautiful plants that will hold the water, will absorb the water, and the mulch will also help prevent erosion. So I can go ahead and check that off on things to do. The next thing they have is uh, core aerate your lawn. Well, we have really sandy soil where I am right now, and I do not core aerate my lawn. So I'm not gonna give myself that inch, but Again, that's only if you truly need it. Now, a lot of places on the shore have heavy clay and you might want to go ahead and think about aerating it. The other time you might want to aerate is if you live in a, a new development where they've gone ahead and recently built. Anytime you have new construction, what they'll do is they'll go ahead and level the soil and they'll compact that soil so that it's easier to go ahead and, and work on it. But once that soil is compacted, 
sometimes it's compacted too much and the roots of grass will never grow. So you do need to think about aerating that, core aerating that to give your soil some relief from the compaction. That would be a good idea. The next thing includes the lawns. So let's take a look at the lawn and see what they need us to do. So the next part is a lawn area. And with Maryland Lawn, we have a new law that says if you're going to fertilize your lawn, you have to do it very, very carefully. You have to have a soil test first. You have to be careful of how much nitrogen and phosphorus you put down. If your soil test says you have plenty of phosphorus, you cannot add any more phosphorus. And also, this is springtime. This is not the best time to be fertilizing your lawn. If you fertilize it too much or fertilize it in the springtime, you might be cutting your grass two to three times a week. So wait until fall when you should fertilize your lawn. But grass clippings, as they decompose, they will go ahead and add all the nutrients that the plants need because the nutrients are in the leaves. And as you go ahead and just let them um, decompose in the lawn, you're actually adding fertilizer. So this one says, basically keep grass clippings, fallen leaves, pet waste, and other yard waste away from the storm drains and that sort of thing. But pet waste you should go ahead and collect and remove. And you should remove the leaves, especially in the fall off a of lawn. But you should leave your clippings so that they can go ahead and decompose and fertilize the lawn naturally as compost. Give myself an inch for that. Okay, then it says plant mulch beds, including trees, shrubs, native grasses, ground covers, along the low edges of your property to catch runoff. Well, we have a lot of flat areas in, in, on the eastern shore, but we still should go ahead and do that. And as you can see, almost all of the beds that I have, you have the ground covers are right to the edges of the, of the planting beds. So we're trying to do a good job of keeping all of the nutrients where they should be. So I'll give myself another inch on that one. We have to talk about rain gardens. So follow me to a rain garden. You know, rain gardens come in many, many different styles. They should be at least 15 feet away from your property because you want to always direct the water away from your foundation. And if you have a basement, you definitely want to have it away from the basement. So what we've done with this is our property slopes down here, and this has always been a very wet area and sort of marshy even. So what we ended up doing is made a very large rain garden bed. So all the plants here benefit from a little bit more moisture than they would get if they were anywhere else. So because the whole property flows in this direction, we have a lot of plants that thrive in rain gardens. So we have uh, these plants right here that are gorgeous. Uh, these are the uh, viburnums. Uh, this is a, a nine bark, which is really pretty. All the daylilies love it here. But then I also have hibiscus. And this is a native plant, uh, perfect for rain gardens. It is the last thing to come out in the springtime. So I like to leave the entire plant like that, if I can, architecturally, it gives me a little interest in the wintertime. But what it does, it also marks, this is where the plant is going to come out of here. As soon as I start seeing some of the green, I can go ahead and prune off all this dead plant material. But other than that, I can go ahead and let it go. And then the rest of the garden just looks gorgeous. Well, the next two things on the list are kind of interesting too. One of them is to install rain barrels. Now, rain barrels are excellent if you have the room for them, but you have to keep in mind a couple of things. First of all, they're awesome. They, they hold water and you can use the water later on. Now, you cannot use the water to water vegetable gardens because you have all kinds of stuff that are on the roof. Birds fly by and poop on the roof and you're really not sure what at least I'm not sure what the, the composite of the roof is. Some roofs actually have a built-in uh, moss or algae resistance uh, to it, so that could be maybe more copper. And copper is really not good for plants. So you have to kind of decide what type of roof you have. Is this worthwhile to get a rain garden, a rain barrel? And if it is, then get one. And the other thing that I'm not going to check, well, I am checking off on my list, is uh, if you have a pet, you should pick up the pet waste and you should put it in the trash can. Now, I do that because I have a backyard that is screened in and the dog is let out there and the dog can do his business there. I would love to say I have trained him to go in one spot. I never realized you could do that, so I haven't done that. 
maybe the next dog I'll start working on that. But I do go out after he's been out every day to check to see if he's left any piles. I don't want to have any surprises. And also, if you can remove the pet waste, then you're also removing chances of excess of fertilizer, but also parasites too. So it's a good idea. So I'll go ahead and check that one. So now we're at the next chapter, and this is called Encouraging Wildlife. And I love this part because when we first moved here to this little house that we live in, there were no trees. All the trees that had been here had been broken down or, or uh, felled by hurricanes or neglect. And so we have gone ahead and planted all the trees that are here. So, so we have oak trees, we have holly trees, we have maple trees, we have crepe myrtles because I absolutely love the summer color. But what this one is about with the wildlife is you want to provide and maintain plants that will provide cover for your birds and your other wildlife to go ahead and make nests in. So in the background, you can see I have a whole bunch of different plants. I have the Native American hemlock. It's Canadian hemlock, actually. I have foster holly, which is a native holly here. And then I have some more uh, southern hollies. They are the red leaf hollies. Sometimes they're called oak leaf hollies. And then I have some crepe myrtles. And then below, I have also have a bunch of different shrubs, some of them native, some of them non-native. But they're all providing the birds with cover so they can go ahead and hide if they have to from predators. It also gives them cover if there's rainstorm or snow. And we, so we have birds here all around, which I absolutely love. The other thing you want to do is provide some water for the birds. So I've gone ahead and put together a really beautiful bird bath. I love this color. To me, this really just shines. One thing, if you have a bird bath, you want to go ahead and keep it clean. The birds actually do drink out of this and then they bathe out of this. So you would not want to be drinking water that you bathed in. The birds don't either. And this is water that you are responsible for. So every other day, you can go ahead and dump the water. And that's not a bad thing because I can go ahead and water the plants behind and then put out fresh new water. The other thing you could do, and I haven't done it, but I have very softly sloping slides. So if there's any insects that land in here, they can get on the side and, and get out very, very easily. Some bird baths are made with a very straight sided uh, edges and that's more difficult for things to get out. If you have that problem, you can go ahead and put gravel or some stones and just sort of line them in any pattern you want to. But that will go ahead and allow any bugs that fall in a way to get out so that they don't drown there. I think that's kind of important. The other thing you can go ahead and do sometimes is add things like a toad house. I know you're saying, what's a toad house? Come here, let me show you. My godson gave me this toad house years and years ago. And I think it is the coolest thing in the world. So here is a little toad house and he's got a little chimney to keep it so, so it's not getting really, really hot and little toads can go in here. Does it work? I don't know, but it is fun. And I think it does work because I have seen a lot of toads hopping around here. Now toads and frogs are really important, toads especially, because they eat a lot of the small bugs that are not necessarily what you want to have here. So I'll go ahead and check out my wildlife, which I truly like. So I've got the shelters, uh, I've inc included, incorporated the native plants into my uh, landscape. I'm encouraging pollinators because I have a lot of plants that are in bloom from spring through summer through fall. And I'm also incorporating plants for the butterfly larva. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of my flowers. So when you're th thinking about what you can provide for the wildlife, it's always good to remember that the butterflies that you absolutely adore, they actually need to have things to eat. So in my herb garden, I have planted dill and parsley. Both of those things get eaten down to the ground. I plant a lot of parsley. That way they can go ahead and have something to eat down. But the other thing I like to do is I have some Asclepia tuberosa, which is milkweed. So I plant it, it grows up, it gets eaten down by the monarch butterfly caterpillars, and then it comes back again. So it's very, very slow to come out, but I want to show you, it's just starting to emerge. So these little teeny things right here may look like weeds to you, but this is my Asclepia tuberosa, and it's just about ready to pop out. I would imagine in a couple of days, it'll be this tall, and then it'll even get taller. So I love the beginning of the plants, knowing that sooner or later that the butter, monarch butterflies will have a place to go ahead and feed, which is good. So let me, let me show you the uh, flowers real quick. You know, when you're designing your garden, it is really, really important to have color 
all through the seasons. So I have daffodil bulbs here in the early spring. I had crocuses here early in the spring. And then this is like mid to late spring. And I have this beautiful moss flax. This is a native uh, flax sebulata, and it's just full of blooms. This has been blooming for almost two months. I absolutely love it. And just about ready to bloom is the carnations, the dianthus. And what's really nice about them is the foliage is a soft blue color. So even in the winter time, it's absolutely gorgeous. And the, uh, the flocks also stays green through the winter. I have some violets popping up and I have a couple of like woodland uh, hyacinths in here too. So I can go ahead and say through the springtime, this is absolutely full of color. Behind me, I have things that bloom in the summer. So I want to make sure that I have things that bloom in spring, summer, and into fall in this garden. So all of the little butterflies and all the little other pollinators that need to be here definitely have fun. You know, lawns can be something that everybody prizes. I look at parts of my yard that has sort of a lawn as more of a pollinator's meadow. So I have a lot of weeds in my lawn because I don't mind the dandelions and the spring weeds and then a few of the summer weeds because again, they give food to the pollinators. But if you have a lawn, there's a couple of things you wanna keep in mind. First of all, where we live on the Eastern shore, we have warm season grasses that are just now emerging in the springtime and they don't require an awful lot of water. That is the beauty of them, but they do require full sun. So if you have full sun, sandy soil, or even clay soil, they will thrive. Now, the cool season grasses, that would be like the fine fescues and the Kentucky blue grasses. They actually do really well through the winter. They hold up their color in the winter time. They look absolutely stunning in the springtime, but in the summer, the heat of summer, they naturally go dormant. And a lot of people like to water them to keep them green, but they actually would do better if you didn't. So when you're looking at, at mowing properly and watering wisely, keep in mind that a turf type tall fescue should be three to four inches high. The reason why you want to keep it that high is two things. One of them, it gives the blade of glass, grass all of that room to go ahead and pull in all the sunshine for photosynthesis. The larger the blade, the more efficient that plant can work. It's kind of like a solar collector. And the other thing it does is when you have the blade of grass is three to four inches tall, it's really better at shading the roots of the grass and the grass roots do much, much, much better if they're not baking out in full sun. Now, if you have a brand new lawn, it takes three to five years to get that lawn to be thick enough and heavy enough to do that. So you have to water a new lawn up a couple of times a week just until it gets fully established. But keep in mind, it takes three to five years to get fully established. So on this checkoff, basically it says, mow your cool season lawn three to four inches high, okay? And it, to encourage a deeper, more drought resistant and pest tolerant root system. That makes perfect sense. And I can do that. Um, you, what you could, they also say that they could use a real mower, which is sort of a, a mechanical one, instead of a gas powered mower, because every time you use your gasoline mower, you are actually adding pollution to the air. I have a little bit too much grass here for a real mower, but if you have a small yard or a condo and just have a small patch, that's a good thing because you don't even have to worry about buying gasoline for it, which is neat, and a little bit more exercise for you. When it comes to lawn irrigation, you want to, to water your, your lawn in the early morning, never in the evening. Okay, the evening keeps the grass blades really, really wet and that can lead them to be susceptible to diseases. Now, if it's raining, you can do nothing about it, but if you're watering your lawn, water in early morning so that the plants can get a nice, cool drink of water. And then when the heat of summer comes by and it's really, really hot, those plants are already fully hydrated and ready to grow into the uh, evening, which is a really good idea. You should really also only water maybe once a week once the plants are fully established so that the lawn can go ahead and keep those roots growing deep down. So roots will always follow the flow of water. Water follows gravity. So if you have enough rain or you have enough water that will continue to allow the water to infiltrate into the soil, it will grow deep into the ground and the roots will follow. If you water very lightly, like say 15, 20 minutes, because that's what you have the thing on a timer, then you only have a little bit of water. So that means that the roots, instead of growing down into the soil, they'll stay on the top of the soil. 
the, there's a couple of bad things with that one. First of all, your plants are not getting the diffused root system that they need. And second of all, those roots are up where it's really hot and they'll bake and that's not good. So remember, water deeply and infrequently and they'll be a lot better. Okay, so let's see now. We've covered lawn irrigation, landscape irrigation. You can go ahead and go and, and water your, your plants if you feel like you need to. I, on the other hand, have all of my plants uh, just growing as is without any irrigation. I do water plants that are newly planted. I sometimes even put little flags to remind myself that's where the new ones are. And I water them the, for the first time when I get them from the nursery. They have been water hogs and they're almost addicted to being watered every single day because they are in a container. Now you've moved them from the container into the ground. So I water them two to three times a week to get those roots fully established and learning that they have to grow down and into the new soil. And then I start decreasing the amount of water just twice a week. And then I do it twice a week for the first year unless the temperatures are over 90 degrees. If they're over 90 degrees, I go back to three times a week. The next year, I will say to them, you know, I've given you a wonderful root system. You're ready to grow on your own. And I let them be. Now, quite often that works out really, really well. Plants like my swamp milkweed, I have killed three of those. And so I have decided that I have to be a smarter person and I'm going to plant my swamp milkweed, which needs wet soil, over in my rain garden where it's naturally moist. Why didn't I think of that in the first place? <laughs> the next part is managing yard pests with integrated pest management. Now, integrated pest management means that you want to be able to know what you're looking for. A lot of people go, oh, I can't stand having bugs in my yard. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of good bugs. Most of the bugs that we have out in, the, in our yards are really good bugs. There's only a very small percentage of, that we consider real pests. But if you have a pest, like say, Japanese beetles, then you, be, you want to be able to know when is the best time to take care of them so that they don't become a pest. And to think further than just going, oh, there's a beetle, I'm going to get rid of it. There's a couple of ways with integrated pest management. One of them is to, first of all, identify what the pest is. And I'm going to pick again on the Japanese beetles. Okay, so when you see them, usually you see them as adults and they're on your plants. The best thing to do at that point, rather than get out a, a can of bug spray, is to go ahead early in the morning and get a little bucket that has water with a little bit of soap, like maybe a drop of soap. And then in the early morning, you can go ahead and actually scrape or bush all of those Japanese beetles into that bucket. Now, if you don't like touching bugs, put a glove on. That's just easy. And the, the bugs will go ahead and not make it because the soap will keep them from flying away. There you go. Now, the other thing to realize that is the Japanese beetle only have one breeding season. So after they're done breeding, that's when they start to lay their eggs in the ground. If you have irrigated lawns or if we have a rainy season, that means that the lawn is perfect for the Japanese beetle female to lay her eggs and the larva will grow beautifully in the soil. If you don't irrigate your lawn, it makes it more difficult for the beetle to lay her eggs, first of all. And second, it makes it harder for those beetle larvae to survive because they need moist soil. That's another reason not to irrigate your lawn, especially if you have a turf type tall fescue or even a zoysia lawn, the, the warm season grasses, so that you can go ahead and let them go dormant in the summer for the cool season grass and stay beautiful emerald green in the summertime if you have the warm season grass and not even worry about those Japanese beetles. So the other thing you need to do also is keep in mind that you have a lot of beneficials and you wanna make sure you have flowers for them. So you can go ahead and check off what you do for the uh, integrated pest management for your yard. Well, we've gone through the Maryland Baywise yardstick and I hope you've had fun with it. I've, it's, every time you go ahead and check something off, you add an inch. If you have at least 36 inches or 36 check marks that are positive, then you have a Baywise lot yard, which is wonderful. Now, if you want to go ahead and get your own Baywise uh, public, so you can go ahead and uh, print it out and go through it yourself, all you have to do is go to extension.umd.edu, and then you'll be able to go ahead and enjoy doing your own Baywise checkout. So thank you so much for joining me for Delmarva Gardens right here on Pack 14.